I was ready to end my life. There's so many bars in this episode. Oh my God. Ooh, she's over here dropping mics. I didn't really feel connected to God through church just because I never felt I was accepted for who I was. I was somebody who was really depressed. What helped you break through that and just stop giving a f there's a lot of noise in the world and some of that is valuable. The journey was the healing. It's not about being completely fearless. It's about just having the courage to start somewhere. It's our ideas that lead to money. Instead of focusing on the money itself, focusing on Welcome to the show, John. I'm so excited that you're here. I feel like this has been a long time coming, at least for me, because we've followed each other online for a while, but I've always just loved your content. And I'm so excited that you're finally here and we get to bring your you know, creative genius, your confidence, your unapologetic energy to my listeners. I know that if they don't already follow you, they're going to be obsessed with you by the end of this conversation. So I'm really, really glad that you're here and that we finally are able to connect in this way. Yes, likewise, Sam. I've been following you for a while as well, and I'm super excited to to have a combo with you and dive in. Yeah. Okay. So I want to kind of get into a little bit of your background because I don't really know that much about, you know, your early life or how you came to be, you know, the, the John Hillstead that we know on Instagram. Like, I'd love to know what your upbringing was like, what your family life was like as a kid. Like, where did you grow up? How did that influence the trajectory of your life for better or for worse? What was those kind of like early stages of life like for you? Yeah. So I grew up in the Seattle area up in the Northwest. And I always had this deep connection with nature. We grew up hiking, uh, you know, as a young adult, I would always be out in the mountains and hiking and camping and backpacking. And so that was my first real connection to spirit to that was my spirituality was being being in nature. That's how I related to God or source or the universe, because I grew up very religious. And I also am a queer man. So those two worlds did not align many times. Um, so I did didn't really feel connected to God through church just because I never felt like I, I was accepted for who I was. And so I kind of rejected the idea of God for many, many years, and I found spirit through nature. So that was my first like connection and introduction to the spiritual realm and to something greater beyond the physical three-dimensional world. Flash forward to 2019 when I had one of my spiritual awakenings, it all changed from there. It all expanded and grew from there. And uh, I think a lot of people see me online. They see this version that's very joyful and excitable and playful. And I wasn't always like that. I was somebody who was really depressed for many years. I struggled with depression. I struggled with social anxiety, suicidal ideations. And this all stemmed from this place of feeling like, I wasn't good enough. Who I was, my true authentic self, was not accepted in the world. And so it was me not accepting myself, actually, right? And so it was just me trying to be something I wasn't, trying to fit into these boxes that I thought society would accept accept me as. And this whole time I was completely rejecting who I truly was. I was completely pushing that away. And all of that built up over time and created this sadness in my life, created this depression, created this feeling of hopelessness, like I couldn't go on any longer. And it got really dark. It got really dark. It got to this place where I was ready to end my life. I was ready to leave this three-dimensional experience and like book a one-way ticket out of here. And I remember sitting in my studio apartment. It was a teeny tiny studio apartment, all I could afford at the time in Seattle. And I was sitting on the bathroom floor and I was ready to end it. And it was that exact moment that divine intervention or whatever you want to call it came through. And I had this awakening in that moment of, whoa, wait a second. I'm not these thoughts. I'm not the, these feelings. I'm not this identity. I'm observing all of this, right? I like connected with my spirit and saw myself as the observer of everything that I was going through. And that was the moment that I felt that I could change. There could be a different way. I could heal. Like there's, there was a glimmer of hope there. And so that was the start of my healing journey. That was the start of my spiritual path and this healing path. And we can get into so many things that happened since then. <laughs> Uh, but that was sort of where it all began was that moment of like, it was, it felt like an instant awakening or an instant moment of awareness. So yeah, it's, um, it's evolved from there. I've, it's, it's 
I've changed and evolved and done a lot of healing on myself. And yeah, it's it's been a wild journey to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I think it, the the wildest part of that for me is that you just had this kind of instantaneous knowing that you were the observer. I think a lot of people gradually kind of work up to that understanding that they are not their thoughts. We learn it through content or books. I remember reading um, The Power of Now or, you know, some people have read The Untethered Soul and, and those types of books really help people to conceptualize of this idea that we are not our thoughts and that we are just the observer of the thought. So it's crazy that that was just like a knowing that like came through for you in the moment. I think for sure divine intervention, you know, like what can I send John in this moment to help him make a different choice and see that there's something else available, that there's another path. But um, yeah, have you had other experiences like that where you've just like received a download so clear and it's kind of like shifted your perspective on something in life like that? Yeah, I mean, actually coming back to that divine intervention, I realized recently that it was future me supporting past me. So the divine intervention was a future version of me coming in to like support myself in that moment. And that hit me at this last retreat. I just was like overwhelmed with emotion. I was like, holy shit, it's me now sending that past me all the love and the hope and the possibility that life can be different. Life can be like get better. And it was just this huge breakthrough of like, whoa, time isn't real. Like all versions of me are existing on parallel dimensions. And I have access to heal my past self and I have access to my future self. And it was mind blowing. Yeah, it was like a real yeah. experience of like quantum healing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm curious. Okay, there's so many questions in my head right now. But I, I want to kind of like circle back to you grew up really religious, because I had some questions for you about spirituality and where that started for you. So obviously, nature was your kind of connectedness to something that's larger than us, something, you know, in that sort of realm of divinity, because nature is so divine. And it's like when you look at the connections between nature and the human body, I'm sure you like have seen all those images, how it all like, connects and overlaps. And it's like, oh, my God, you're the universe. And so am I. And we're all the universe <laughs> in one. But I, but I'm wondering if you know, like what your relationship was or your understanding was of this idea of of God or some sort of greater power having grown up in a religious environment where you felt rejected or not accepted. At what point did you kind of shift into a, a different understanding of spirituality or perhaps at some point you circled back? to an understanding of spirituality that does include God, but it's from a more empowered place now or from a more loving, accepting place. I'm just curious about what that was like for you. Yeah. So growing up in the church, I had this idea, and I think most people do who, who will grow up religious, that there's this man in the sky who's saying, this is right, this is wrong, right? This is good. This is bad. This is evil. And that just didn't resonate with me, especially as someone who deep down knew my truth, my freedom, my authentic expression. I love men, right? I'm queer. I'm gay. And that wasn't accepted by the church. And so I was like, wait a second, something's not matched. Something's not lining up here. Um, so I completely rejected that idea for many years and found that spirituality through nature. And then later through my healing journey, through plant medicine journey, ayahuasca journey, I came back to understanding God from a different perspective, understanding God as I am God. You are God. We are all God. We are all spirit extensions of God, extensions of source, extensions of the universe. Um, experiencing reality from our unique perspective. So I came back around. <laughs> I came back to the around to the idea of of a source, but as um, as an evolved self, as a from a new perspective, and um, finding my own connection to that source, and not having somebody tell me what it is. Yeah, I love that, and I so resonate with that as well. So if we go to the moment, which maybe, you know, some people might call it like the dark night of the soul, the rock bottom, whatever, that moment where you really felt like there was no hope, there was no future, there was no point. And then you receive this sort of divine intervention, your future self is is coming in with this information to say, hang on, like, don't mess this up. There's another, you know, version of you that's on a parallel timeline that like has done all these other things. Like there's another way. After that, what was, what were the steps that you took to really change from that that point was there any tangible actions or did you start consuming a certain type of content did you go into therapy did you start with coaching like was there something specific that you did for your mindset what did you actually do from that point forward to really like kind of evolve your self-concept and what you believe to be possible and available for you 
Yeah. So when I had that breakthrough moment, the divine intervention, I fully dove in to personal development and healing. I was like so fired up and excited to make a big transformation because I was so tired of living the way I was living, right? It gets to a place where like you can no longer bear it. It's like that painful to stay stuck. It's more painful to stay stuck than it is to like do the things to like change your life. And so I was diving into, I was just absorbing like YouTube videos, how to heal depression, how to heal social anxiety, diving into all the spiritual materials and the books. The Power of Now was one of the first books I read and just consuming and absorbing as much information as I could. This led me to feeling a call and a pull to work with plant medicine, to work with ayahuasca. And this was very early on in my journey. Like at this point, I didn't even know what a crystal was, right? I didn't even know anything about angels or guides or any of this. I had very little information and little experience when it came to my spirituality and the spiritual realm. But I just had this like pull and this knowing and this call from Aya to work with her. And so I was driving DoorDash at the time while working my job to make ends meet, to pay for this trip to the Amazon of Peru. Like I was doing everything that I could to make this happen. And I packed up all my stuff. I booked my flight to Peru, flew into the Amazon and did a 12 day plant medicine journey with, with ayahuasca. And my soul knew what it was getting into. My ego had no idea what, <laughs> what was going to happen. It was honestly like quite traumatic. It was looking back. I'm like, wow, I was actually traumatized by this experience just because I didn't really have the tools available to me at that moment to move through this deep, deep personal work. And yet looking back, I'm like, I'm so glad that I did it, right? I have no regrets about the experience, but it was it was hard. It was challenging because you're met with your darkness. You're met with your shadow. You have to face things that you've never faced before and in a very like visceral, visual way. So it was this huge quantum leap in my healing journey that was messy. It was ugly. It was scary. It was all the things, but it was also the most profound and most loving and beautiful experience I've ever had. And it sort of was like this expedited process to get me to where I needed to be so that I could show up in service for the collective. Because this all happened in September of 2019, right before 2020, right before the pandemic. And so I'd done this like expedited healing work that then allowed me to show up in 2020 in service for for the world when people needed it the most. So it was like my soul was just like, okay, dude, like, let's go. We got to We got to get it together. We need like an expedited process. It's going to be hard. It's going to be scary. It's going to be challenging. But that's kind of the type of person I am. It's like, I'm usually like the all in or nothing, right? Let me get both feet wet. Let me jump all the way into the deep end instead of just kind of putting my toe in. Yeah, I was going to say that is full on deep end dive. <laughs> Like first ex has has one has one spiritual awakening and is like I'm gonna do ayahuasca. <laughs> Wild, like really, dude? You wow. couldn't like ease your way into it. You, know, you had to go all the way in. Yeah, wow. But obviously there was a purpose to that because then you know it changed a lot for you personally, professionally. I mean, 2020 was a huge time. I think at that same time, September of 2019, I was starting my first ever, you know, beta round of like coaching. And I was starting to work with women for the first time ever. And then I got to the end of it. And I was like, I was still working full time as a teaching assistant in Spain. And I had these clients on top of it. And I was running to Starbucks in my lunch breaks and taking clients like on Zoom. And I, it was so scrappy. It was messy. And I was still learning. And by the end of it, I was like, I'm exhausted. And this is going to burn me out if I don't figure out how to scale. And so I had to hire someone. And but then t it was like, I was doing all of that, you know, kind of in this fast, expedited, messy way because 2020 came and so many people needed me. So many people needed my support. They needed my guidance. They needed my wisdom. They needed my leadership. They just needed me to be there for them. And, you know, I'm sure you also were part of that huge, you know, rise in consciousness that happened during that time. And it's just so cool to like look back and thank our past selves for the work that we were doing and how we were being prepared in the lead up to that so that we could be of service to ourselves and also to the world because that was such a huge shift for so many of us. I can't even believe that that was only four years ago. You know, I'm sh like you're probably mind blown as well because you've grown so much. Your business has evolved so much. You as a person are probably like night and day. And so that vortex that we all entered together in 2020 was like, OK, like, here we go. <laughs> like, what's going to happen here? And so we needed to we needed to show up for that fully for ourselves before. So yeah, I think it's interesting to just kind of see those parallels and how there's so many of us that were called to kind of be light workers during that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 2020, I look back, a lot of people, you know, see it as like the the worst 
case scenario, the worst thing that ever happened to the world that I'm, it's like my, my favorite year. It's like the year that I've grown the most. It's the year that I've expanded the most. It's been so transformational for me. And like, I'm so grateful for it too, as well, because it allowed me to fully step into this purpose of being a mentor, being a coach, being a healer, because I lost my job during the pandemic, my, my nine to five. Yeah. And so that was kind of like the push that I needed to fully dive in 100% to my, to my soul work. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I remember I was I was teaching at the time. So schools obviously all closed. I was an English teaching assistant in Spain. It was making shit money. But the schools closed and they told us like two weeks, you got to go home. And I was just so excited that I was going to have two weeks to be like a pretend full time entrepreneur. <laughs> and then that two weeks turned into forever. Like I literally never went back to work. So and same, you know, for you, which is crazy. So I kind of want to talk about, you know, a lot of your people see you as in your content as this, you know, wildly confident, self-expressed, authentic, unapologetic person. And, you know, we know from what you've shared with us about your story that that hasn't always been the case. But I'm curious, you know, this is something that you've been able to help a lot of people with at this point in in your work. So I'd love to know some of the tools or modalities that you've seen really help people step into more of this unapologetic confidence, self-worth, allowing themselves to really be seen, especially online, regardless of those, you know, fears of opinions, perceptions, projections that might come from other people. What helped you and helps your clients break through that and really just stop giving a fuck? Yeah, I mean, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's been so fun to do this work and so fulfilling to see the results happening with my clients and the people in my world fully stepping into that, like, fierceness, that fierce visibility and feeling that confidence to show up as their most authentic self. Because I think at the end of the day, that's that's what we all want is that freedom to be ourself in the world. There's been a lot of tools. There's been a lot of modalities that I bring in to help support clients based on who they are and where they're at. A lot of it is very intuitive. And so I have my tool belt of tools that I have, and then I bring in what I think would work best for that specific person. A lot of what's helped me personally has been subconscious mind techniques for reprogramming stories and limiting beliefs, uh, NLP, hypnotherapy. I do this technique called time, which is a timeline therapy that helps go to the root of the belief when you first made the decision that it was unsafe to be yourself and clearing it and releasing it from the root. Breath work, movement, dance. It's really a combination of all of this mind, body, spirit uh, that helps create these breakthroughs for people. And I think also it's encouraging people to start somewhere. For me, starting online was fucking terrifying. It was fucking terrifying, right? I like remember posting something and throwing my phone and not looking at my phone for like two days because I was so terrified of what people would think about me, right? So I would like hide from the criticism or from the opinions of others. It was what I needed though. I needed to get my feet wet. I needed to start somewhere. I needed to start taking the action, even if it was messy, even if I wasn't fully ready yet. There's something to, to be said about just starting, right? Starting that momentum and then figuring out as you go. It helps to build that confidence. It helps to build the belief of what's possible. It helps to build that safety around being myself online. And so it's a little bit of like showing up while you're scared, realizing that it's not about being completely fearless. It's about just having the courage to start somewhere and then healing as you go, right? And letting the shit come up to the surface as you're sharing yourself online. The journey was the healing, the the showing up consistently and moving through the fears that are coming up and the triggers. Like that's a part of why I'm showing up. That's a part of why I'm doing this work. It's it's for my own healing. It's for my own soul expansion. So I always let people know that like there's always another level of of visibility and another level of healing to be done uh, as you continue to to show up in the world as your authentic self. That was a bar. The journey was the healing. I feel that so much. It's like there's no way to, I think people have this perception or this idea that they can heal it first and then do it. And it's like, no, the way that you heal it is by doing it. <laughs> like you really just have to like step forward. In, in everything, whether it's like business or showing up online or confidence or, you know, healing stuff in relationships, like you do it through practice. Nothing gets easier if you don't practice it. You can't build proficiency in anything without repetitive action of doing the thing. So I think that's a big permission slip to anyone listening that's like, I've really been wanting to do this thing, but I feel like I'm not ready yet. It's like, well, you're not ready yet because you haven't started yet. Once you start, you'll get you'll get ready. You better let them know. You better let them know. <laughs> you're not ready because you haven't started yet. So start yeah. and then, yeah, wow. Get, get, get fucking ready. Okay. 
you mentioned dance, which we have this in common. I think that, you know, I grew up as a competitive dancer for many years, but dance still remains just one of the these core parts of my personality, I believe. I, I don't know if dance was something that you always felt attracted to or like you always danced even from when you were a young age or if that's something that it started happening for you as you became more confident and more self-expressed. But I'd love to hear your perspective on how dance is so healing and really is one of the best energetic practices to help you manifest, to help you shift your identity, to help you, you know, adopt a feeling of more confidence or bravery. Like, Talk to me about what dance has done for you in your life. I never grew up as like a dancer or I never took dance classes or anything like that. I, I grew up when I was very young before I had all the stories about what people think about me and, you know, all the fears about being judged. I was this very freely expressed individual who loved to be on stage. I loved to perform. I was in Cats, the play, and Wizard of Oz, and Oliver Twist. So I, I did all these musical theater performances, and that just was like an extension of my expression. Um, so this kind of core to who I am is as a performer, is an artist, is a someone who's very creative and expressed. And that got shut down for many years. And so through my healing, it's allowed me to reconnect to that child-like self. It's allowed me to to reconnect to that inner child who was freely expressed and, and moved and flowed and sang and created in that way. And so through my healing, movement has become core to my practice just because it allows me to tap into the the most the highest, most expanded version of me without judgment, without limitation, without overthinking, without getting in my own way. It's just fully me being present in who I am and allowing my body to flow and move in the way that it feels intuitively guided to flow. And that is freedom for me. That is liberation. That is fully present to the moment. And I feel like when we're fully present, when we're fully connected to our highest, most authentic self, that's when we're most magnetic. That's when we are the most powerful because because we're not getting in our own head in our own way we're not focused on i need to do this and look like this way and, and and it's not all preconceived it's just fully expressed and fully authentic and so for me every time i'm in a dark place or a hard moving through a hard time or feeling overwhelmed or anxious about something it's always been music and dance that has brought me back to the core of who i am my true essence back to this present moment so it's huge i do it every day it's like my spiritual practice <laughs> yeah and it also helps me like tap into the like the inner beyonce or the inner britney spears right like i ha do a catwalk and the catwalk i pretend like i'm on stage or i'm walking the victoria's secret runway right and it's like you can't stop me i'm unstoppable baby like that's just where i feel the most powerful yeah the catwalk is iconic like we we all know it from your content it's iconic your videos get me so fired up. I'm like, damn, I need to I really need to have a dance party with myself because this is John is like firing me up right now. So I always I always recommend that to people. Like I think that's one of the fastest ways to shift your state. Like your energetic state completely changes when you put on a a song that you love and you just allow yourself to like get into it and release like all the inhibitions and everything and just like let yourself be and feel the music. There's nothing more powerful and more easy to be honest, to help you really elevate and raise your frequency and become like the magnet for all of the things that you're desiring in life. Because like you said, you do tap into that unstoppable kind of like really confident version of yourself. And that's where the magnetism lies. So I love that so much. Okay, so speaking of like magnetism and attracting the things that you want in life, I want to talk about reprogramming beliefs around money because this is something that you share a lot about in your content. And you mentioned something in one of your posts about how like if you are getting on a plane and you walk by and you see the people flying in business class or, or in first class, like what you think about them is a reflection of sort of like your experience, your relationship with money and that you had an experience with that yourself that that really encouraged you to shift the way that you thought about wealth and what you felt was possible for yourself. Can you talk about that kind of shift when it came to money and possibility and your own identity as someone who was able to become wealthy? Thank you for bringing that up because I love talking about the shift that happens when you move into business class or first class because that's a big shift. Like that moment is huge. 
And I wasn't always wealthy. I grew up very like lower middle class. You know, we weren't completely broke all the time, but we weren't like balling, right? There was always stories in the house about, oh, we're on a budget. It's too expensive. You know, I wouldn't get like the Crayola crayons. I'd get like the Rose Art crayons, right? I still got crayons, but they weren't like the top of the line crayons. So I just grew up with these stories and these beliefs and, you know, generational, this generational belief around money and it's the scarcity of it. And there's not enough to go around and we have to hold on to it when we have it and any potential or possibility to be wealthy just wasn't even available to me for the longest time and yet there was this knowing since I was a kid that I was meant for more there's just this like I think a lot of people experience this maybe you have as well there's just this like I'm meant to be successful I'm meant to be famous or I'm meant to be wealthy like I'm meant for something greater than this so there was always that like underlying drive and desire for more when my external which is the me. the future self timeline kind of like coming in it's so crazy i remember as a kid being like i'm gonna be a millionaire i don't know why i would ever think that like i did i didn't know any millionaires i didn't like my my family wasn't like rolling in the dough like, i don't know it's wild how you sometimes you just have that feeling of like i'm meant for more yeah i had the same thing and it was just like i don't know how but i know that it's gonna happen at some point point. and so it was like the external was showing me something different telling me that money is scarce telling me that it's not possible to only certain people have that attain that level of wealth and yet there was this still this inner fire that was like wait a second i'm i'm ready for more it's possible for me so it was really a battle between those two versions of like which one is real which one's gonna win and i've done a lot of work reprogramming my money mindset through a lot of these techniques that i that we're talking about through you know nlp through hypnotherapy through affirmations through embodying my future self now and shifting the identity and getting into spaces that make me feel wealthy getting into environments that help me to calibrate to that level energetically and i feel like that's one of the tools that i love sharing is like go to places that make you feel abundant go to places that make you feel wealthy get into the room with people who are wealthy so that you can then calibrate energetically and rise to that level and so first class business class was one of those things that i was like i need to be there i need to be up there like there's something that i i just need to be up there and so the very first time you ever book a business ticket or a first class ticket it's fucking scary because you're like holy shit why i'm spending so much money on this thing and it's a stretch out of your comfort zone but then once you do it you can't go back there's no going back you've already calibrated to this new level this new identity it's like okay now who do i need to become to sustain this or to continue to elevate and 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 be somebody who flies first class who flies business class it's a game changer it shifts everything around you too it's like you know you just become a different person when you finally make that decision to say fuck it i'm no longer an economy person i am somebody who flies first class i remember the first business class flight i ever booked and it was i was going on a retreat in costa rica and it was like my birthday what well, it was going to be my birthday while i was on the retreat and i had been a little bit under the weather uh, a couple days prior to going so still feeling a little bit like like groggy, tired, and it, and I was flying from Spain. So it was going to be this like 11, 12 hour flight. And I was like, there is no fucking way I'm sitting in economy for this flight. It's my goddamn birthday. Like I'm going on a retreat. I'm an abundant business owner. Like fuck this. I'm, I'm flying business class and I'm going to lay down and I'm going to sleep on this flight and I'm going to enjoy and I'm going to enjoy it. But I remember I, I didn't know anything about flying business class. So I, I didn't know that you got special treatment outside of what happens on the plane. So I, I, um, luckily I, f I found out that I could go to the lounge. So I did go to the lounge, but I waited in all of the regular lines to like check, <laughs> to like check my bag. And like in the security, the guy was like, you know, you have a business class ticket, right? Like, you can go to like our separate like security area. And I was like, what? <laughs> It's just so dumb. I had no idea. So you, it is scary. It's like you do. It's like it's a whole new th the process and like identity that you have to learn. But I think once you do something like that for yourself, you also realize and then you understand. Like I remember recently I was fly flying business class from Egypt and because that was a really long flight too. And I just remember sitting there looking at this like beautiful menu of all these foods that they were going to bring me and like the, the dessert cart and like unlimited this, unlimited that. Like, And I was like, this is actually worth the price. Like 
Like I actually am understanding the exchange of value that's happening here. And I think that happens for in a lot of things that when you when you don't put yourself in those rooms or those spaces, you don't understand the value exchange. But once you experience it, you you kind of just realize that money is not just, you know, dollars. It's this sort of like uh, just, I, I call it like this this holy resource. And it's really just made so that we can have a, a, an exchange of value. And when you experience that exchange, you're like, yeah, I would pay for that again. That was amazing. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I think also, if you're listening, you have not yet flown business class or first class. What you said was huge about it's not just about the seat and the flying. It's about everything that comes with that. Like you get to go into the priority line. You get the priority ticket on your bag. So your bags come out first. Like, oh, my God, I didn't even know that. I remember that blew my mind. I was like, what? Yeah. When you check your bag, it like comes out first on the belt. I was like, wow, this is this is next level. Yeah, it's like it helped me ke- like stay step into this new space of like, wait, I value convenience. I value ease. I value like having an easier life. Like I will pay for convenience, you know? And before it would be like, oh, let me get the cheapest ticket just for the price. And let me, but that also comes with waiting in the longest line. That also comes with, you know, being in the smallest seat. And it's so it's like, you're not only paying for the seat, you're paying for the ease and the effortless convenience of the experience of travel. Yeah, totally. And there's just so many like lovely perks when you even get like all the warm hand towels and, you know, the drink as soon as you sit down, they know your name or at least your last name, you know, that like it's so helpful with things like valuing your time, I think is a huge part of it. And also for me, it's it's a lot about valuing my well-being. So depending on where I'm flying, I know like if I really need to be well rested or I need to be well fed, like that's going to be an avenue for me to do that. And, you know, the more the more that you value your time, the more that those things sort of make sense. So I think, of course, everyone wants to manifest money, right? We're talking about reprogramming these beliefs. And and that example of business class is just like one way that you can kind of start to change your mindset around what's actually happening there and what's available for you. But I know you've talked about your first manifestation was like a check for $5,000. Can you talk about like some of your top tips for manifesting money? Because I think a lot of people are really, they, they limit themselves a lot. They're really narrow in their thinking about what's possible when it comes to manifesting money. Yeah. Yeah. So that first money, chunk of money that manifested came in the most unexpected way. And so I think a lot of people are so focused on money coming in one way. Oh, it has to come through my business or it has to come through my job or it has to come in this one way that's super logical that I can conceive is possible for me. And I think what really is fun and fun to play with and, and powerful is to open up to the infinite possibilities, the infinite ways that the money could come in, right? And so of being so narrow-minded and focused it has to come this way it's like no wait i'm open to it coming in any way in any shape or form so that's how i created that experience and that's how i continue to manifest money but i also would invite people to instead of focusing on the money itself focusing on manifesting ideas manifesting brilliant ideas because it's our ideas that lead to money think about all the ways in which you've earned money it's probably in your business it's come through an inspired idea it's come through a divine download that you receive. You're like, oh, wait, this program idea is amazing. I want to take action on it. And this is going to help support so many people. We're going to go on this retreat, right? It was that idea that you had that then led to the money. So I think if people are having resistance to the actual cash number or the idea of money, it's like, wait a second, let me just manifest a brilliant, beautifully inspired idea and let me take action on that and the money will come as a byproduct of, of that idea. Such a good tip. Do, is there anything that you find to be really helpful for some of your clients that are in that space of wanting to manifest more abundance, whether it's, you know, personally, professionally, they're an entrepreneur, doesn't really matter. Is it like, obviously, dance is, is a practice that we talked about that helps like elevate your frequency. So that's going to help you manifest literally anything. Is it affirmations? Is it EFT? Is there anything specific that you love or that you know that your clients really like vibe with and they find it to be really useful. Yeah, I love like affirmation recordings. So I created a few of them for my clients and I also listen to them at night. Every single night when I go to sleep, I'll listen to those affirmation recordings on repeat. Even if I'm just sitting here working, right? Just doing work. It's like going into my subconscious mind and continuing to reprogram my mind. Cause I find that it's not like this thing that you're like, oh, it's one and done. It's like, no, it's a continual process of continuing to program my mind for these, for these wealthy beliefs, for these 
limitless beliefs. So I do a lot of affirmation recordings. Yeah. Are they, do you like subliminals, like where they're underneath the music or do you like them where you can like actually hear the affirmations? I like both. I tend to create the ones that I can hear myself speaking. And I recommend that for others as well as like make your own recording with your affirmations, right? Don't rely on someone else to give them to you. Find the ones that you resonate with, that you align with, that feel expansive and abundant for you and make your own recording. Like you literally take your iPhone. That's how I made my first one. And I just used the voice note and put it over music and made my own affirmation recording. So I feel like, you know, hearing your own voice and and choosing the specific affirmations that work for you is is actually beneficial for each individual yeah it's kind of like an audio version of like a vision board like make your own make it yeah yes i love that <laughs> <laughs> so good yeah i kind of want to make like some more of those tracks because I've, I've definitely made them before and i have them in like a meditation library and some of my programs and stuff but i'm getting inspired because i want to update them and i want to make some new ones so thanks for that tip i love that I've made them for viral content. I've made them for like going to the gym. So you can do them for literally anything, not just money. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hot tip. We love that. So good. So you did a post uh, about manifesting sales and business success. And you shared this one affirmation, speaking of affirmations, um, like my business is in high demand. And I remember I commented on it because I was like, slay, my business is in high demand. I love that affirmation. Um, Yeah. Is there anything else that's like supported you in being a match for continued business growth and success specifically? Yeah, I think it's really, for me, I've, gone down the path of doing what I think I should be doing in business and like choosing to do things from my ego versus my soul. And so my invitation for business owners would be to really tune into what it is that you desire to create, what it is the path that it feels most aligned for you and not what the rest of the world is telling you you should do. Sometimes it requires that we put up the blinders and focus on what's coming through us, our channel, and blocking out the noise because there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of noise in the world. There's not a lot of noise online. And some of that is valuable, right? Some of that helps us stretch. Some of that helps give us permission. And at the same time, it can also be detrimental because it disconnects us from our unique path and our channel to source. And so whenever I'm feeling like I'm out of alignment, it's time to throw up the blinders, to stay in my lane, to really allow myself to move from my soul in my business. And that always, that always creates success, that always creates money, that always creates fulfillment and satisfaction is when I'm listening to myself. And that doesn't mean don't get into the rooms and don't get a mentor or coach. That's so valuable. But it's at the end of the day, choosing to discern between what feels in alignment for you and what feels like a should. Am I doing this because I think I should do it? Or am I doing this because it satisfies me? I always say that my favorite strategy in business is satisfaction. Like, mm. what, it, what is satisfying you in your business? Like, that's why we start our businesses to begin with, is to be satisfied, right? Is to experience a life of, of pleasure and joy and satisfaction. So why would we do anything other than that within our businesses? And I think that the more that we tap into our unique satisfaction within our business, we're going to feel good. We're going to feel great great. We're going to feel energetic and inspired. And that's going to come through on the other side to our audience, to our client. They're going to feel that, right? Yeah. You've ever like done a program that wasn't fully aligned, but it was because you thought you should do it. And it just wasn't like landing for people. And it, yeah, it's like, it doesn't work. You have to always trust yourself and trust your knowing and, and what's calling you and inspiring you. So it's like a reminder to just like take a moment to calibrate where you're at and figure out, okay, am I doing things in my business because I think I should do it because it's worked for other people? Or is this, ex is, or is this satisfying me? Is this what I want to do? Is this what feels in alignment for me? Yeah. I had a client ask me just recently, like, how do you decide what product or program you're going to create next? And I was like, well, I just wait for the idea. Like, I don't sit down and be like, okay, what should I create next? Like, what's the next product or program or course going to be? Like, no, I just, I, I live my life and I wait for that like divine inspiration, that download to just hit where it's undeniable. You are so excited about it. It's pouring through you and you're just like ready to create. But I think that we only are available 
available to receive that when we have spaciousness in our lives and like you're talking about putting the blinders up. And so in one of my masterminds, I we just started this yesterday. I bring them through this creative vortex challenge because it's something that I did for myself, which is exactly similar to what you were talking about of like sometimes you just have to like get in your zone, stay in your lane, like listen to yourself, block out the noise. So, you know, we mute, we unfollow like uh, so many accounts. We do like no stimulation walks where we're going on walks with no music, no podcast, no audiobooks, no input. It's just the silence that we can be available to receive the ideas. And there's a couple, a couple other like elements to the challenge. But yeah, I think that's like such an important piece of advice for creative entrepreneurs, especially is, you know, creation is bringing something to existence out of nothing. So there has to be space for that nothingness. If you don't have the spaciousness, there will be no creativity. Um, and I'm obsessed with the business strategy of satisfaction. I've said this for years. I always say my main business strategy is self-trust and and yours is satisfaction. And it kind of like lines up how you were like, I just need to like be in alignment with what's going to make me feel good. And I'm like, I just need to be in alignment with knowing my truth and trusting myself. But it's that exact same sentiment. So I love that so much. Such good tips. Do you do like social media detoxes? Do you like try not to see what other people are doing in your niche as it pertains to like manifestation or retreats or like, is there anything that you do like uh, tangibly that helps you have like the blinders up per se? Yeah, right now I'm actually doing an hour a day on Instagram. So I have my settings set for one hour maximum, which is not a lot of time to like no. post something to like reply to a couple things to put your stories up. It's not a lot of time so it doesn't allow space for me to then scroll or look at other what other people are doing i don't do that all the time but i do it at times where i find myself comparing or i find myself scroll scrolling a little bit too long so i'll do that and i'll also do like actual complete detoxes as well like recently i was in on a retreat in peru another i retreat and i completely shut off my socials for the for the two weeks and it was hard I, it was actually really hard i noticed how the pattern of me always reaching for my phone to go on social and it not being there it was like oh, wait a second oh, okay <laughs> wow um it was actually really challenging for me to do that but also created so much time for me to to go within and to connect with myself and to just be and yeah reconnect back to 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 myself and and build more self-trust and receive new ideas and and uh yeah i feel like it's necessary especially for us business owners who use social media as one of our main platforms for marketing to create a boundary with it and mm -hmm. You know, to really give yourself time away so that you can recalibrate and fine tune and then come back even more lit up and even more filled up than you were before. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of our relationship with social media as like a digital entrepreneur, as a content creator, what is your formula if you have one for content creation like what kind of content creator are you do you just like have an inspired idea and create it in the moment and then post it right away do you plan do you batch is it a whole mix of things like how do you create your content i'm like a run and gun on the fly type of person to be honest i wish i was somebody who could batch and schedule i know that probably would be really valuable for me and i'm moving into something similar where i do you know have like a a bank of things that i can share but typically for the most part if i'm being honest it is very like in the moment it's when i receive the idea or i have this breakthrough and i feel called to share it in that moment and i also find the value in that is it's it's real and it's now and it's present it's coming through in that moment so the energetics behind it are are, are i feel a lot more potent alive yeah yeah, I was literally just talking about this on a call with some of my mastermind clients the other day, like the energy of like a transmission or a share when it's coming through is potent. As you say, I, I, I say that it's alive, like it's like ideas. If you ever read like Big Magic by Liz Gilbert, like this idea that like ideas are alive, they're these like energetic sort of like beings almost that that come and they want to be born and they want to be pushed out into the world they want to be made real i really believe that when you have like an inspired idea it's it's really alive it has the most vitality in the moment that it's like received and it's felt if there's emotion attached to it it's really alive which is why sometimes those posts where you're just like oh my gosh i'm really feeling this and you pour your heart out and you write it and you're like just post it right away like they get such uh incredible reception because i believe there's an energetic transmission 
in it and that idea is really alive. And so other people can kind of feel that through the screen. I don't know if you feel feel the same, but I think that's so real. So real. So true. Yeah, I found that as well in my experience. The reception of the posts that you're not really like planning or structuring or overthinking. It's the ones that are organically coming through that you share. Or just super cup. random. Yeah. It's like why people say like the most random post is the one that goes viral because you are probably just like, oh, like I'm kind of feeling this. Like I'm just going to whatever, like I'll just post it. And then that's the one. The one that you spend three hours on is like a flop. Yeah, <laughs> so true. And I feel like that's what I help a lot of my clients do is like get out of their own way so that they can be in that flow state and organically share what is wanting to be birthed through them in that moment. Yeah. Without getting into the yeah. analysis paralysis of like, is this the right thing? Is this not? Should I do it this way? Are people going to judge me? It's like, no, this message is coming through you as a channel to be shared. Like, can you get out of your own way for that to come through? Yeah. Yeah. So good. Just run and gun it, like you said. I love it. Okay. Last thing. Last thing I want to close with, because I heard you say recently that part of your vibe for July is this is like quantum manifesting over linear manifesting. So describe the difference for us and how you are personally going about this. Yes, I love this. So I have been really excited and playing with the idea of time lately. And um, it's really put into perspective the way that most of society manifests. And the way that most of society manifests is very linearly. It's very like, here's my goal. My goal in Dece by December is to hit a million dollars, right? So I'm going to take the necessary steps required over these next six months to get to that end goal that's in December. December that's in the future, quote unquote, the future. And so most people are thinking very linearly, right? There's a future, there's a past, there's the present, when really there's only the now. The, fa the past and the future are just other versions of now. And so linear manifesting is putting it out into the future and working toward that future. Quantum manifesting is recognizing that all potentials exist simultaneously right here in this now moment. And so whatever goal you have is available to you right now, whatever dream you have is available to you right now, it's not something that's out in the future and at a distance, it's possible for you now. So then it's like, okay, well, that's great and all. How do I create that dream now? How do I close the gap faster, collapse the time faster? And it's just simply connecting with that version of you, connecting with that quote unquote future version and asking yourself, what what does that version think? What does that version believe? What types of actions does that version take? Who is it that I get to become to embody that version in this now moment? And so it's it's just this new way of thinking of time and realizing it's an illusion it's a construct it's a it's a it's a right it we're, time isn't real it's just our perception of it that's real and anything is possible right now all possibilities mm -hmm. exist right now and so just exploring that idea and being curious about it is the first step for people because i know it can seem a little bit confusing because we've lived our lives so linearly right mm -hmm. uh, every year i turn i get a year older we start in january we end in december Right. It's this very linear way of thinking. So just being curious and being the playful energy of what if it were possible quicker? What if it were possible now? What if it were possible, you know, tomorrow or today? Yeah, I think we throw a lot of our people are it's like, OK, I'm finally open to this idea of dreaming big. Right. So I'm going to see myself as having the potential to be this bigger, more successful, more fulfilled, happier, joyful, abundant version of myself, whatever that looks like. But we we cast that vision out so far into the future so that I think in some ways it's like a protective mechanism so that we're not actually required to make really big changes now. It's like, oh, if I think that's going to happen in 10 years or in 20 years, then I don't actually, ha I'm not forced to change anything about my day to day or about my current existence or about the way that I'm operating or seeing myself or showing up now. And so I think what you're talking about of believing that all possibilities of your life and all the versions of you on those future timelines exist right now in the quantum reality. They're already real somewhere on a, on a parallel timeline somewhere. So if we can access that, if we can tap into the version of ourselves that is already there, then we can shorten that gap, collapse that timeline and bring that closer. But what that's going to require is that you have the courage to actually show up as that, you know, bigger future version of yourself now. And I think that's what a lot of people are resistant to because it's going to require you to do some brave shit, right? Because it, it doesn't happen without the action. And so I think that's why it's easier and more comfortable 
to believe in our big dreams, but to believe that they're 5, 10, 15 years out into the future, rather than, as you're saying, adopt this radical curiosity and idea of infinite possibility of what if it's possible in five months instead of five years? What would that mean that I have to do, though? What would that require me to change? What, how, how do I need to show up more responsibly for my future self? Like, what is in my life right now that's not working, that doesn't align with that? I got to let that go. Ooh, that's scary. Ooh, there might be some people that don't get to come along with me. Ooh, like, right? And so we protect ourselves by believing that everything is so far away, protect ourselves in air quotes. But what if that's the biggest risk of all, you know, is betraying your true potential and just believing that the journey has to be so slow? Ooh, she's over here dropping mics. <laughs> betraying your true potential. Damn, I love it. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I got to let some shit go in order to be that. And that's scary sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, what is what is going to be required of me? What are the demands that I have to meet in order to make that future version real and and to, you know, draw it towards me faster than what I think is maybe possible? Yeah, growth is um growth is a, an interesting one. It's uh it's not comfortable. <laughs> it's definitely not comfortable. <laughs> And it's no. like, we didn't come here to be comfortable either, right? It's like, wait, that's what we came for. I always like reframe this and I always think about my biggest dreams and the things that I desire. It's like, not about, it's not about that. It's not about the end result. It's not about the destination. It's about who I get to become on the way to it. The manifestation, the dream is just a byproduct of the soul expansion that we came for. It's like about the journey. It's about the process. The process is the prize. Yes, the process is the prize. You guys, there's so many bars in this episode. Oh my God. Make you can make this your manifestation track. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so much, John, for coming on and sharing all of your wisdom and, and your stories. I'm so excited to share this episode with everyone. I know they're going to love you. If you guys don't already, please go follow John. John, shout out like your main platforms where people can find you. You are such a um retreat king. You have so many retreats. I feel happening all the time. So if you're looking for a really expansive, incredible retreat experience, I'm sure John can facilitate that for you in some amazing jaw-dropping location. So check him out. Where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram mostly at John Hillstead. And then I'm also on TikTok at John Hillstead. And would love to have you at a retreat. Retreats are lighting me up at this moment. And the next one is in Peru. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah. And that land is super special for you. Obviously, it's been such a big part of your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Deep, deep connection to, to Peru. So I'm excited to, to share that with this group of people. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, my gosh. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If you enjoyed it, please copy the link, send it to a friend, someone that you know would love this conversation, a manifestation bestie, someone, an entrepreneur, someone in your life that you know would benefit from this. Send it to them. Let them know you were thinking of them. Uh, let John and I know what you loved about this conversation. If you guys love John, if this episode helped you discover him, please go over to his DMs, drop in there, say hi, let him know that you're coming from the podcast. We love to see how our worlds are colliding and connecting. So we really appreciate that. And um, we'll leave everything in the show notes for you guys to connect with John. And we will talk to you guys next week. Love you. Bye.